Welcome to yet another episode of Beyond the Pod, brought to you by Culturama and SodaStick.com. I'm Brandon Molesky, Pat Micheletti with me. And uh, Pat, uh, we have plenty to talk about. How are you doing first? Good. How are you? Good to see Good. you. We have lots to talk about with uh, free agency going on uh, since we last chatted, including the Minnesota Wild getting a goaltender. But uh, we're going to start with the head coach of the St. Cloud State men's hockey team, Brett Larson. Brett, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. And uh, I, I know Pat said last week that you guys maybe had some quarantining stuff going on through uh, COVID. Can you kind of explain uh, what's been happening with your program? Yeah, first off, great to see you guys, and thanks yeah, for having me on. I, I always enjoy it. Um, yeah, right now we're – well, I'm about to go back on the ice with the majority of the team, so that's a good thing. Um, obviously, they've got the contact tracing thing down now, and whenever you have somebody test positive, uh, a lot of times what happens is you try to make sure how far it's spread and whatnot. We had a brief quarantine. Um, we had everybody uh, just uh, quarantining at home. Uh, right now, it's just uh, a couple guys and their roommates that are going to have to quarantine for a little bit longer. It doesn't look like it's spread to anybody else, and we're going to get the majority of the guys back in the ice today. Brett, you and I were talking, though, yesterday, a couple days ago, whatever it was, and, you know, you had said to me, you know, the, the hardest thing is is the guys have nothing to do, and it, it's got to be it's got to be frustrating for those guys because they they're, they're used to coming to the rink, being on the ice, you know, getting their work done, and and now they can't, you know, couldn't do anything. Yeah, that is the toughest part, and we all know as hockey players, right? What do you want to do? You want to be around your buddies. You want to be right. around the guys. It's the best part of hockey, right? Being in the locker room and and getting to see everybody every day and enjoying that, and that that is the hardest part. But you know what? I think they understand that it's the price to pay to have a season. And yeah. As hard as it is, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it right. We're gonna stick to these cr- protocols. We're gonna wear masks. We're going to do whatever it takes to make sure we get to have a season. And I think that's the one driving force that even though uh, it is different for them, they know they want that. I mean, it, this is really weird. I mean, I, I was saying we could have been in St. Cloud last weekend doing a game. You guys playing a game, should have been playing a game. And here we are still kind of waiting, you know, to get everything rolling. Yeah, it's a strange feeling. Uh, I know it is for our players. It is for our staff. You're trying to determine – uh, just even with your practices, how hard do you want to start pushing? You don't want to start pushing right. too early and burn the guys out before you're going to play. You don't want to start too late, and then you're not ready when you play because we still don't know the exact start date yet of when it's going to start. So we know what's coming up here in November, which is exciting, and we know that the guys uh, we know the guys uh, are excited about that. But it it is a little bit different feeling that way. How how much has changed for you? You know, I just 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 coaching in general. I'm sure there's there's a lot there's a lot going on that you have to take care of. But then on top of uh, COVID protocols and not knowing exact schedules, I mean, how much has this kind of been kind of taken over your brain on a daily basis? I it, it is a strange thing because as a coach, what you have usually is you have some structure and a schedule. You know, I've been a part of coaching for a long time now, where you kind of week by week you're building towards your season, and you know what you want to work on in those weeks and. And you know what you think best prepares your team for starting those first couple of games. So you don't really have that progression, which is a weird thing. We've tried to focus on a couple of things, skill development, uh, fun, and our off-ice training. So we figure worst case scenario, if we're sharp and crisp, we're in great shape and the guys have a good energy, that's, that's a good thing right now. And we figure once we get that start date, we can start building in the systems and the special teams and that type of thing. Before we uh, talk about your team a little bit, um, you've had some changes on your staff. I know Mike Gibbons, um, after a terrific career, great guy. I know he was great for you, your first year coming in. Um, he retires, and you bring in Dave Shyak uh, from Western Michigan, who's been a Division One head coach and uh, a great guy, great recruiter. Um, geez. Why don't you tell me about about Dave and why you added him? Well, first I'll start with Gibby, one of the best ever, and uh, yep. one of the best recruiters ever in this game, and a guy yep. that's so passionate about the Huskies and hockey. And I wish him the best. He's out living on his lake now and enjoying life a little bit. Still get to see him once in a while, and and he's coaching the the Blades U15 team right now. So he's he's doing a little coaching even. Good and good, uh, good for him. But really lucky to get Dave Shyak. It's a guy that I coached against, competed against, had nothing but respect for. He did a great job recruiting at Western Michigan, obviously in this league, head coach at Alaska Anchorage. And I think for me, just going into my third year as a head coach here and with Ollie being fairly young as well, I was really looking for a guy with a ton of experience, a guy that's been through it before, sat in this chair before, a guy that I could lean on to help, to be honest, help 
myself keep getting better as a coach. Sure. A guy that had that experience. So those, those were a couple of the biggest things for me, that recruiting experience because, hey, it's the lifeblood of college hockey. Without the right players and people, you're not winning. We all know it. And two, for me, I wanted to keep growing and learning and, and being able to get a guy that had been a head coach at this level meant a lot to me. How, how have you been dealing with recruiting then over the last six months where you, you, know, you don't really have <laughs> hockey going on? I hit, you forget to contact kids virtually, I guess. I mean, what, what, how, is, how has recruiting changed? How has the landscape of that changed in the last six months? Well, it's all been virtual, and it's funny. It's gone in different phases. Uh, very early in the spring, we went after a couple grad transfers that we really wanted. It was a full court recruiting press. Uh, a lot of big-time schools were on both these kids. Um, it was a full ba- recruiting battle, virtual battle for the first time <laughs> in my life. Yeah. And, and we were really excited to get him. Seamus, Seamus Donahue, a, a defenseman and the captain at Michigan Tech, and Jared Cockrell, a captain and a, uh, uh, one of the top forwards at Colgate, really filled a couple holes that we felt we wanted to fill and, and help us get better. So what did you change virtually then to, um, to uh, you know, when you're, when you're battling with another, uh, other schools virtually, what, what, did you, what did you do you know, specifically that stood out? Well, we put a backdrop of a beach and palm trees outside of the Herb Brooks Center on the Mississippi <laughs> River. The kids thought that. Uh, we told them that's how it looks here year round. But uh, you know what? It, it still comes down to relationships. Uh, you have to find a way to build those relationships with those kids. So, you know, whether it was over the phone, uh, whether it was virtually uh, having the people in admissions be able to give virtual campus tours. Um, for me, the biggest reason we get kids i think at st cloud state is because they get a sense for what our culture is about and what the people are about so you're still really trying to build those relationships kind of like we're doing right now just uh over zoom quite a bit and and over phone calls quite a bit and doing the best you can to make sure you don't lose that personal touch is is the thinking behind going after players that you went after these uh, two two grad you know uh, uh senior graduates whatever uh is it be- because they have the experience, they can help the younger guys? I mean, obviously, they have to be good players, but is, is that kind of the mindset going in? Or, or or is it to, you know, just fill holes that maybe you lost from a year ago? You know, a little bit of both. We were looking for up front a guy to kind of replace Nick and Jack Paling. We, we thought good. that uh, good. that was right? the type of player we definitely wanted to uh, um replace and it's hard to get a freshman to be able to step in and play like that well jared cockrell plays like a rat he plays hard uh he pressures pucks he does all those things that that we really liked and he's done it in college hockey so we wanted to get a little bit older a little bit more mature quicker Mm -hmm. and we also wanted to find a really uh mobile puck moving defenseman uh in in seamus donahue and that's what we found so a little combination of both pat we had a couple holes we wanted to fill and we wanted to get older and more mature quicker. We still had that huge group of 16 freshmen and sophomores from last year. And I think this maturity and bringing a couple of guys in that had been captains at college in college hockey has been really great. And the feedback so far from our guys has been awesome. They love them. Um, Brett, you know, I, I get these calls all the time. When, the, when is the season going to start? What's going to happen? What's going to happen with the league? Um, you know, the, right now it, it, it appears and nothing is, as you mentioned, etched in stone but it looks like um you're going to start the season in a bubble um can you tell the people that are watching this what that may look like what that might encounter granted we do not know yep. if this is a sure thing you know if it's going to happen where it's going to happen and and just uh, kind of some of the particulars that you know you think might happen Yep. And again, I, I want to let the people know right away, this is, I'm part of discussions. I know these decisions aren't final. So um, right, you know, I may right, say something right. here that ends up not happening, but I know there are sure. discussions about a couple cities in our league where we'd be looking uh, to go into a bubble to try to play 10 games. Uh, it'd be about a three week bubble. We'd have a certain amount of quarantine time before going into the bubble where our team would literally just have to be at home or at the rink. Same with the mm-hmm. staff try not to be around anybody else. There'd be testing protocols during that quarantine because you'd be trying to get all the, all eight teams into that bubble clean, obviously, without any positive cases. And what you want to do is be able to rip off 10 games in that bubble. Uh, we'd get in there. We'd try to play a lot of our travel games where you'd have a lot of, you know, you'd limit a lot of travel later in the season. And if mm-hmm. all goes well, you get those 10 games in the bubble. Hopefully we let the guys get be able to go home for Christmas and, and see their families and then come back and try to play 16-game uh, league schedule following uh, the new year. 
uh, which would give us a 26 game league schedule, which I think all things considered, that'd be great. And, and I know the players are really excited if that could work. How do you handle, you know, you have to tell me, in part, is, are all the kids school-wise just doing that all distance learning at this point? And then I'm guessing that's the assumption then is they would be doing distance learning on the side while they're inside the bubbles preparing for hockey? Exactly. That's uh, Some of the schools are done by then. Uh, some of the schools would have finals going on during that time. Most of our guys are almost all online. There's a couple of classes where you go in once a week where they have everyone socially distanced and whatnot. But uh, the schools would all work with the professors to make sure that they can finish up anything on the semester online while they're in the bubble. Well, let's move to your team. Um, I, I know, you know, that you're, you're pretty excited about what you have coming back and, and some of the new guys coming in and, um, you know, you know, losing the Paling brothers, uh, that in itself, just their energy and their excitement and, you know, what a great four years they had. But, uh, you know, you got to move on. Uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, some of the guys you have coming back and what you're excited about. Well, I'll tell you, I, I'm excited about our team speed. Just watching our team in practice right now, our forward group is very skilled and they're fast. Um, I, I really, the guys that you're hoping are going to make big steps this year um, are guys like Sam Henches and Nolan Walker and guys that have been really skilled, good players in college hockey, but I think they're ready to make a step to be difference makers. I could see Easton Brodzinski having that. The, the year of his career here as a senior. He, he's had one of his best summers I've seen him have. He's in great shape. He's ready to go. And then you've got this group of guys like Yami Cranla and Zach Okabe and Chase Brand, these kids that were freshmen last year and had really yeah. good freshman years, but they're ready to step up. And then you got those glue guys like Fitzy and Hammer, and I, I hate to leave anybody out when I'm talking right, about right, those guys, right. but, but I, I really, I'm excited about our forward group. And, uh, and then our D group, I just think we've got a lot of solid depth You've got Nick Perbix and, and and Spencer Meyer and and Trable and Bushy and a lot of these guys coming back that played minutes. You got Tyler Anderson and Jay Cox and and now adding uh, uh, our grad transfer with Seamus Donahue gives us that kind of real puck moving, a little more dynamic. He's not quite a Jack of Sean that that right, right. Sort of dynamic, but he is that mobile puck mover like Jack that I think really helps us replace that. So I love the depth on D. And obviously with David Rennick coming back and Lamaru and Caster here, I think our depth and goaltending is as good as any as well. So I got to admit, we're, we're really hoping we play because we're excited about this team. Can you uh, specifically talk about uh, Sam Henches? Because uh, the Minnesota Wild drafted him uh, two years ago, I believe, in the seventh round. Yep. Um, many people, I'm a Tatino Grace alum, many people say he's the second best defenseman in, in uh, TG history behind me. Um, <laughs> Uh, but just tell Wild fans that haven't gotten a chance to look at him, what, you know, what do you see specifically about Sam Hengis that you like that you think you can take maybe that next step up? Well, I can tell the high school legends are off already because he's a forward, so people forget. Oh. You know, people forget. I'm an idiot. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know what? He looks like he's on a mission to me. He's he's actually put in about he's put on about ten pounds of muscle, and all his speed tests so far, he's gotten faster. Oh. So. Um, that's that's a really good thing. He he's he's tra Sam takes his game really seriously. His training is serious. His nutrition, his off ice, everything, and he looks like he's on a mission. He's been great in practice. Um, I can tell he's very motivated to have a great year, and I he's really heading in the right direction. He's becoming he's becoming a leader on this team. Every day he shows up to work, whether it's in the weight room doing extra. I mean, I come in in the morning at times, and and he's the only guy in here at I you know six thirty seven in the morning. He's in there shooting pucks. He's that kind of guy, and uh, I can tell he's really motivated. And and you know what? I know it's just practice and preseason, but boy, he looks good. Well, I tell you, it, what it really impressed me with is he is so explosive. You know, um, you know, if he can, uh, to me now, to me as an analyst, just looking at his game, if if, if at times he could just not necessarily not necessarily slow it down, but just understand. He has that ability to blow by a guy and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be a hundred miles an hour all the time. And, yep. and uh, if he refines that finishing part of his game, oh boy, he could be, he could be one of the best forwards in the country. I agree with you, Pat. His first couple steps, like in, in a, in a position low in the offensive zone, if he gets a step on the defenseman, he's, he's able gone. to separate and create space to make a play or, or, or take it to the net. And, uh, you're right. If that finishing, you know, he, he led our team in grade A chances the first yeah. half of the year by far, by a mile. Yeah. And uh, if that part comes, I think he'd be great. You know, you, you mentioned that speed too. another guy I forgot to mention that I think looks real good this year that could break out. I think is a kid named Micah Miller. 
Uh, yeah. Mike has got that. Oof. He's got that powerful speed. And yeah. when he learns to use that and, and play at a high play, pace off the rush, he's as dangerous as anybody. Yeah, he was fun to watch in the state tournament a couple of years ago up at, for uh, Grand Rapids. Uh, let's talk about some of your new guys coming in specifically. Uh, I know uh, you have a kid from Finland who was just uh, drafted in the sixth round of the NHL draft. Uh, one, what can you tell us about him? And two, how do you go about recruiting somebody from Finland? Well, yeah, Mike Gibbons' legacy. You know, Mike had done a, a great job over in Finland and created a lot of really good connections. And and him and Nick really worked that one hard. Uh, right now, though, unfortunately, he's still in Finland. He's taking okay. all his classes online. He's full time here at St. Cloud. Oh. Uh, but they've had a couple flare ups with the virus, where the embassy's been shut down a couple times over there and uh, had some visa issues. Now, I got to say, this week has been as positive as ever. Uh, they just contacted him again yesterday. It looks like it's getting to the end of it. So as soon as that visa comes through, he's on a plane and over here. So hopefully that'll be any day now. Uh, but he is a high-end, talented kid that we're really excited to get here. Uh, we've got a couple other local kids. Joey Molinar was a Herb Brooks a, a award winner at, at uh, Minnetonka. Oh, that's right. Uh, state, you know, a uh, state champion there who had, unfortunately, some injury problems in junior hockey, but still had a good career there. Uh, Jack Johnson, an SPA kid who played three years up at Fairbanks in the North American League as well. Um, so it's not a very big class at all. It's pretty small. Obviously, last year we had 10 freshmen. This year it's a pretty small group. Uh, but we definitely, when you, well, we call the grad transfers freshmen, kind of. But right. With a, new, with a new class coming in, we're really excited about it. Can you tell me about, uh, you know, there's now going to be a sixth Minnesota team uh, once uh, University of St. Thomas moves to Division One two years from now. Does, does that have any impact on you guys in terms of, you know, just another school that's competing geographically in the same area with you for players? Yeah, obviously, you're always excited when Division One college hockey grows, no doubt about it. That's yeah. why we're all in this game. We want this sport to grow, opportunities to grow. At the same time, St. Cloud's going to have to keep getting better because we got another team out there that we're going to be recruiting against. So, um, yes, I'm excited. But uh, you know what? When you're at this level, though, you have to compete against the best all the time. So, you know, we're recruiting against the best schools in the country on a daily basis. So this will just be another one to add in there. But, but we uh, are happy for them. Yeah. Uh, the league itself, um, you know, every year you look, every year you see great players leave, but then great players come in. And it, it obviously no different this year. Um, North Dakota obviously is going to be, you know, they have a lot of guys returning. Uh, UMD lost a few of their stud players, but uh, it, uh, once again, it, it, it should be another great, great season. And it looks yeah, like we, uh, I, I think it is going to oh, be. Yes. You got me. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah now we got. Yep. Uh, you know what? I uh, I agree with you. This league, year in and year out, is the best league in college hockey. I really believe that from top to bottom. It's it's as good as it gets. And I'll tell you, that's as far as recruiting goes, it's it's nice to be able to recruit that league because the players see it. And you look at the yeah. teams that have uh, been in the national championship and won it and, and all those things, the league championships. It's been a, a fantastic league. And um, it's going to be, yeah, North Dakota doesn't lose much on paper. They're the team I think we're all chasing to start the year. We know that. But we also know in this league that it could be any one of us um, because the teams are always all so close. And that from one to eight, you got to battle every night. It's going to be a war in that bubble. I know the guys. Yeah. Are, uh, <laughs> the guys are are excited about it because you're going to be playing one. You know, every night you're playing a top team in the country. You're going to be playing three games one week, four the next, three the next. It's going to be all hockey all the time, and you're going against the best. So uh, I, it really excites our players that this might happen. Brett, we really appreciate your time. Uh, good luck going forward whenever the season happens to start. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah. All right. Thanks, thanks Brett. Talk to you soon. All right, Brett Larson, the head coach of the uh, St. Cloud State men's hockey team. And uh, before we talk um, some NHL free agency in Minnesota Wild, let's talk about Soda Stick. Go to sodastick.com to get your original Minnesota sports-inspired goods. If you haven't seen the stuff yet, you got to check it out. Uh, all their apparel is screen-printed here in Minnesota on super soft, super comfy shirts and hoodies. You will love it. And uh, we're going to hook you up with free shipping on your next order. So make sure you use the code KFAN for free shipping. That is sodastick.com, original Minnesota sports-inspired goods. Use the code KFAN for free shipping. Uh, free agency started one day after our last podcast last week, Pat, and yeah. we kind of we kind of assumed that the Minnesota Wild would go after a goalie, and that would be about it, and that's uh, pretty much what they did. They signed goaltender Cam Talbot to a three-year, $11 million contract, so $3.67 million again, uh, annually against the salary cap. Uh, there were lots of goalies available in free agency via trade. There still are some available out there. Uh, what were your thoughts on the Wild opting in the direction of Cam Talbot? 
Well, if they were going to shoot for the moon, um, you know, I, 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 I really wanted them to, to get Markstrom. Okay. That, that was probably pie in the sky because he's making what we thought that he would make. And that's in the $5 million, maybe a little bit more than that range. And so um, they're getting a guy in Cam Talbot, who I believe you and I talked about. I thought, I did not know that he was a free agent back when we discussed a possible deal with, with Calgary that we were floating out there. Um, and um, so they end up getting him. I think they got him at a really fair price yeah. under 4 million, um, not more than three years. And, you know, he's had, um, he's had a lot of success and he's had, you know, some down spots, I guess, not unlike any other goalie. Right. Um, yeah. But I think he's coming to the right team for that because Minnesota defends so well and they've got such good defensemen. And um, regardless, Brandon, Minnesota needed uh, and nothing against Dubnik or Stalock or Kakinen or any of them, just a, a, a change, I think, yeah. to excite the guys. And so I, I think uh, I think Cam will be uh, be just fine. Yeah, you know, Markstrom with the the amount of money and especially the term, the amount of years he went for, I, I I don't know if I would have wanted to go that route for a guy who had one really good year, but even at his age, you know, twenty nine years old, yeah, um, I, I'm I'm actually I'm I'd rather have the Talbot type on a shorter shorter term at a much smaller, mm -hmm. you know, they don't have much money invested in their goaltenders here. No, they and, don't. And, and as you mentioned, I, I do think this is one of those spots we didn't see it last year, and we haven't seen the last two years. But I do think it's one of those spots, you know, because they are so good defensively that that other goalies can kind of shine here. That just because their numbers weren't spectacular somewhere else doesn't mean that 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 they that they can't get better here. I think it's a good spot for Cam Talbot as well. Yeah, so do I. And and just to 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 give you an analogy or a uh, a comparison, I should say, um, you look at the Vegas Knights goaltending with their two goalies. They have twelve million dollars yeah. tied up. In two, Minnesota has less than five million dollars. Think about that for a second. In, in three, <laughs> or in three, because yeah. Kakinen makes. Uh, I think he signed for seven fifty. Um, Staylock makes seven fifty, and you got the three point three. You know, do the math, yep. right? Um, so, um, yeah, they don't. They, they don't have a lot invested there. They have a lot invested in their decor, which we know and. You know, that, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out with Matt Dumba. Um, uh, I know what Minnesota has, like, a little over $2.5 million on caps. They don't have a lot. Not a lot. Um, but, you know. Uh, and you might, be, you might be hoping Marco Rossi takes up some of that. Yeah, I'm not if sure. He can make, if he can make the team year one. Yeah, that's right. So you, you have less than that, right? So, yeah. Um, you know, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see if Billy is able to make another move, uh, whether it be a Matt Dumba or you know somebody else. And um, uh, we have uh, you know another month uh, to really take a look at that. You know, that's why uh, people have been saying about uh, Zach Parisi being traded. And from all I've seen, the only suitor has been the New York Islanders. Right. And uh, they're pretty up against the salary cap as well. So to trade Parisi, you're going to have to bring in probably their junk in return that costs the same amount. But both teams really don't have a lot of wiggle room where one team can take on more salary than the yeah. other. So I, I'm I'm not really uh, thinking a Parisi trade is going to happen at this point. But, you know, with, with Bill Guerin, something could change, you know, four hours after this podcast. Right. And, and, and uh, you know, let's not forget, too, and I know we're going to get to it, but um, we're in a pandemic and an odd year, right? If this was maybe just a normal year, um, there may be more suitors for a guy like Parisi or whatever, or, or other, other players. Um, I, I think teams are being really, really careful uh, in looking at their, at their uh, salary structure yep. and you know, what they're, you know, just trying to get through this year, the best that they can. Some teams, you know, have a little bit more room, but, um, but I think teams are being awfully, awfully careful and and uh, and trying to stay from the stay away from the the high salary guys. Does that explain why uh, Taylor Hall got a one year deal worth eight million dollars with the uh, Buffalo Sabers? You know, he was the most premier free agent on the market. 
Uh, was the money just not there for him? Did he just want the one year prove it? And why why do you think he opted for Buffalo? Um, you know, the the talk is he he's had a good relationship who's the, who's the head coach. Um, uh, Ralph was in and, and when Taylor was there. So, you know, there may be a comfort level there. Um maybe to play with Jack Eichel. Um, uh, you know, that that would be an interesting pair. Uh, pair together um you know and again maybe the market wasn't there uh for eight million at five you know for five years or six years or um and and listen uh, taylor hall to me and 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 this is why i'm kind of leery about the eichel hall connection you got two guys who haven't won you know and and i think there's a i think you have to know how to win or taste it and and neither neither of these guys have done it with their teams, and uh, you know maybe they'll do it together. We'll find out. They're both very talented, but um, I I think it's uh, I think a lot of teams. Uh, All right, you know maybe maybe it's a prove it year for them. Well, they do have Eric Stahl, who uh, won a Stanley Cup uh, with the Carolina Hurricanes, so maybe. Uh... He is the winner that they are looking for. Let's uh, move on as we uh, have temporarily lost uh, Pat Micheletti here. And uh, let me maybe talk about uh, Culturama, one of our sponsors, uh, while we wait for uh, Pat Micheletti to uh, jump back on board. Culturama uh, is, uh, have you ever been uh, told your hockey playing child has what it takes to be the next big superstar? Does he or she stand out? Where you are unclear how to obtain player exposure to meet that goal? At Culturama, they cultivate, collaborate, and connect you with opportunities to advance your child's athletic career. They offer free firsthand knowledge on how to become your child's momager or dadager. Or for those who are looking for specialized services, Culturama is here to help. They will uh, personalize a strategic brand, uh, plan, develop PR and media kits, build and or manage your child's brand. Follow, like, and subscribe to Culturama today to learn how to get started. That is Culturama, uh, one of our sponsors on Beyond the Pod, of course, with uh, Soda Stick and SodaStick.com. Let's see uh, if we can get Pat back on. Pat, you there? I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I don't have video for you, but as long that's as I can right. hear you, no one wants to as, see me anyway, as long as I can hear you, that's. I want to see that pretty face of yours. This is the best you've looked in a long time, at least for those watching Thank on the K, yeah, watch for, watching on the K, on the KFN YouTube channel. Um, all right, let's talk about some other uh, Minnesota Wild moves. Then they uh, re-signed forward Jordan Greenway to a two-year, four point two million dollar contract. So, uh, two point one million against the, the cap. We've. Uh, We've talked about Greenway a lot. Bill Guerin has been very vocal about what his expectations are for Jordan yep. Greenway coming into the season, that uh, this is the year it's time for him to take the step up. It has to. Um, listen, uh, I'm, I'm sure they received a lot of calls on Jordan because why wouldn't you? You know, when you have the body and you the size and the skill, um, you know, it's there. And so where it's got to be there for him is upstairs. And, uh, you know, hopefully – um, he can get to the the point where he is owning people night in and night out. And, and um, um, you know, he, he has all of the capabilities to do it, but it just, it doesn't show up every night. And so I know Jordan has talked about it, but um, you know, he's got to, he's got to become a little bit more consistent and that's what they're hoping for. Um, I think the, I think the message was sent to him and hopefully, you know, he'll take it and run with it. That's that's the hope of uh, of the wild. Well, it sounds like, you know, from Bill Guerin's standpoint, they just want him to work harder and be more of a professional. And you, you yep. look at a guy that size who's got pretty good hands for a guy that size who can skate yep. well for a guy that size. Man, if you just think you, you know, if you just huh. take that extra step of eating what you're supposed to eat and, you know, putting in the work and, I, you know, this, I don't want to say sky's the limit. It's not like he's going to be Connor McDavid or something like no. that, but. Um, he has uh, a set of tools that a lot of players in the International Hockey League don't have. Never. Good luck finding them. I mean, you, you don't find guys like that. But, you know, you just can't have three quarters of the package. Um, a lot of it, you know, is the thinking, the preparation, the focus, and, um, you know, the trust in yourself to do it. And, you know, that's what they're looking for out of him. And, um, I mean, he could really elevate. Uh, I don't know if he'll play in a top six role. Uh, but I tell you what, if he plays the way he can uh, in a third line role in a top nine, 
role uh, and help you on the power play here and there and, you know, kill some penalties. I tell you, that that would make uh, – that make, it could make Minnesota a different team if he performs to the level that we're all – that we all think he's capable of uh, uh, performing at. You would think a guy like that would just score 10 goals a year just based off of uh, just get just the screen, get screening the goalie and have pucks come off your shin pads yeah. and rebounds. I mean, he, sh- he should be very difficult to move right in front of a goalie. Oh, a- absolutely. And, and what does that do, Brandon? If he plants himself there, um, you know, that, that frees up more room for, for your other forwards uh, yeah. and, and, and your D sneaking in and, you know, uh, it's so many options that you have when you have a guy that kind of owns that slot area, that front of the net, the behind the net, um, you know, he should be able to come out, you know, and, 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 and win a battle with a, with a defenseman of any size and come out of the corner with the puck and, and then boom, everything opens up and he can make plays. And uh, you know, so, you know, we, we're hoping to see that type of Jordan Greenway this year. Uh, Miko Koivu, when, when, when he was done with the Minnesota Wild, Pat, and from everything we had heard, it sounded like he was contemplating retirement or contemplating uh, just going back to a Finland and playing there. Well, he signs a one-year, $1.5 million deal with the Columbus Blue Jackets. So, uh, And I also saw one of his comments uh, for why he wanted to keep playing and wanted to play specifically in Columbus was uh, – give himself a better chance to win in the playoffs because he hasn't had a lot of success there, which I found funny with Columbus because it's not like they've had the most success right, other, than, right. other, than, other than beating Tampa Bay in the first round two years ago. But um, uh, your thoughts on how Koivu fits in in Columbus with uh, John Tortorella? Well, I, I think um, I think a couple things. Um, he's not going to get any faster, Brandon. Uh, no. He, he's just not, okay? Okay. Um, He's going to win draws, okay? Um, he's going to be great in his own end. He's not going to get you a lot of offense for your team. They're talking about him being their third-line center. That's getting more minutes than your fourth-line center. Um, you know, we'll see how it plays out. Maybe Tortorella has a strategic plan on on how to play him and how to use him, Um and I, I think he'll play eventually. Um, you'll see him on a fourth line there playing a role, a shutdown role. And, um, you know, hey, listen, he, he, he has a fire in his belly to, to keep playing. Good for him. I'm happy for, you know, for his, for him. And, and uh, but I, I don't know how much he's going to add to the Columbus Blue Jackets at this stage of his career. Yeah, they keep counting on him as being a third line center, and I, right. I, you know, he was he was a fourth line center on a team that didn't have a lot of depth at center last year. So I, I, I don't know if if a third line center role is in the cards for him at his age. And as you mentioned, um, he's not getting any faster. That you know, it's only, he's only going to be getting slower if anything. So I, I'm curious to see how uh, Koivu ends up uh, fitting there for a team that you know typically plays a speed game, Pat. Well, exactly. I was I was just going to bring that up, Brandon. Uh, they like to play a in your face type of game and yeah. and and get the puck and get it out of their zone, you know, with uh Warinsky and Jones and you know the D that they have. Um it, it'll be it'll be an interesting uh, to watch how how Miko does this year. Um yeah, he is with a good team and a team that you know a lot of a lot of people uh think are are you know on the verge of of uh of, of getting to a cup. So um, it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to watch. There's a lot of uh, free agents still available. I know you just, you were just mentioned a couple minutes ago, but yeah. maybe teams not wanting to spend the money uh, given the uncertainty of what's going on. And there's, there's organizations that are furloughing their employees and um, are, are, are hurting a little bit financially just because the NHL is so attendance based, but uh, you know, Mike Hoffman's still available. Uh, a couple former wild players, Mikhail Granlin, Eric Hall is still out there. Yeah. Uh, what do you what do you think is going to happen? Are, are they, a lot of these guys are just going to have to take kind of one year deals and hope hope that the market resets and they prove themselves over uh, the course of the next year. Yeah, I, I I think that'll be the case. And and there's one guy, there's one guy that I've targeted on that list. That really, I want the Minnesota Wild to to sign uh, if they can get him. Now he might be too expensive. Um, uh, I, you know I don't know, but uh, Dadenoff from Florida ultra talented to forward. I think, um, 
uh, you know, I think he was close to, I don't know if he had 20. I don't know. I don't know his stats. I don't have him in front of me, but he's really, really um, a talented player who I think would, would certainly play in the top six here in, in Minnesota. Um, but he's unsigned. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know if it's because he wants more money uh, than, you know, that teams are willing to offer. But boy, if, if Minnesota could get their hands on him, I think that would really bolster. And and here's the deal, Brandon. I'm afraid a team like Chicago is going to come in and get him and uh, and really, you know, help a Patrick Kane or a Taves or a Kubalik or, you know, someone like that. Then, you know, you, to a certain extent, um, you might have to try to sign a guy to play defense in terms of other teams in your division picking up some of these players. Yeah. I know uh, some of the Blackhawks uh, veteran forwards, at least anonymously, I believe, have not happy uh, have voiced <laughs> voiced their displeasure with what the with the direction of the Chicago organization through the offseason here. A team that uh, I guess technically they made the playoffs last year based off of twelve teams getting in, but they, they haven't been a playoff team for a couple seasons. One guy that did get paid, Pat, is uh, Alex Petrangelo. He goes to huh? Vegas, seven years, eight point eight million dollars per season. Pat, I like him. I like him. Um, I'm not sure he's worth especially at his age, though, seven years, $8.8 million. I, d- I don't know if he's that good. <clears throat> it is a risk. Um, he's a very good player. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I look at Drew Doughty. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of compare those two a little bit. I think Doughty's even probably a little bit more offensive than, than Petrangelo is. Um, it's a risk. They want to win a cup. I mean, there is, I mean, there were, rumors Brandon and I don't know if they're still talking or not about trying to acquire Steven Stamkos from uh Tampa Bay. Yes. Um right now Vegas is like 6.5 million over the cap. So <laughs> I don't know how they would do it. I have no idea. Um because they're they're, they're going to have to shed some salary. They they just for, shipped out Nate Schmidt so they could get for Chandra on, on the Right. Books. Right. Um so I, you know, I don't know how they're going to do it. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, it, you know, they, they think with the forwards that they have that adding Petrangelo back there is, is going to be, you know, obviously key to the power play, key to the penalty kill. He plays a ton of minutes. He was a captain, um, you know, good leader, but you're right. There's that long contract again. And, you know, uh, what's he going to be like in seven years, you know? So, uh, their goals to win a cup and worry about it later. Yeah, you know they still have Mark Andre Fleury's salary on the books, and I'm sure they're trying to shed if they can find a suitor for him that might be able to clear some space. But you know the report I think you saw regarding Stamkos that Taylor Hall was also in that report of that they are right. Vegas was interested in Taylor Hall. It sounded like they only wanted to give him like a one year five million dollar deal, and that maybe he just took the more money in Buffalo. But um, yeah, 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 they are they are going big game hunting in Vegas. Yeah, and and I don't know if I read this. Uh, or someone told me, but uh, I think the plan right now is, and and I think they have to say this is to keep Leonard and Flurry. And again, that is twelve point five million dollars uh, for two goaltenders. And so, uh, you know, again, you know, maybe they have to say that or have to say that now until they can try to get another team involved where you know they can move uh, Flurry. Um, cause he's got two years left on that deal. Uh, so it'll be, uh, you know, it's, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how Vegas really, you know, puts this team together. I know they offered patch I, I think he makes, um, maybe one and a half million less than Stamkos does. Uh, I think they tried to pedal him off, um, in return for Stamkos, but, uh, you know, again, teams are, 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 are tight against the cap and are being very, very careful with their money. And uh, our final topic, Pat, uh, St. Paul announced that the, and it's been announced that St. Paul will host the Frozen yep. Four in 2024. I know they're going to be in Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay in 2023. I think Vegas in 2026, uh, which I'm excited about because I get to watch the University of St. Thomas in their third season make it to the Frozen Four live here in person in the Twin Cities. Hey, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, uh, when, it, when it gets to college hockey, Brandon, you know, we look at teams and, you know, they're, 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 some teams are eh, maybe not so good at the beginning of the season, and then they get hot, and then you get a hot goaltender. And college hockey is really, really weird that way. And, uh, 
look at Duluth, uh, the the first of their back-to-back national championships. They made it by 0.001% yeah. to get in. Over the and Gophers. Then, and and the, over the Gophers. And yeah. Um, they, they're, and I think they gave up a total of three goals and and they needed an utter collapse. I think from the Gophers over the last, what, like three, four or five games of that season for them to even get into that spot. I don't don't know what, how the scenario played out, but, um, their goaltending got, and their defense got so hot that, um, you know, they were able to win a national championship. So you just never know. I would love, I would love to see, um, you know, it's at least three, but all four teams, out of the six, uh, play in St. Paul in 2024. My pipe dream, Brandon. <laughs> Pat, I appreciate your help as always. Uh, great, just seeing a black screen and seven. Look at your face. That was well, much, I, yeah, I, much you know, better I, for the I, viewers. I, I, yeah, I, I'm giving you a break today, Brandon. So, all right. Anyway, we'll have talk- a great week. Yeah, you too. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you. All right, he's Pat McLeodie. I'm Brandon Molesky. This has been another episode of Beyond the Pod, brought to you by Soda Stick and Culturama. Thank you so much for uh, listening on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts or watching on KFN's YouTube channel. If uh, you're watching for the first time, make sure you subscribe to uh, the KFN YouTube channel. Uh, If you're listening, please also subscribe, rate, and uh, review. We really appreciate it. Uh, We'll talk talk to you next week right on Beyond the Pod.